All right, so we'll uh, get started with the second part of the lecture. And uh, now we have two pretty important circuit types. There is DNNF and there is deterministic DNNF. Before we talk about more types, and there's two, as I said earlier, that we'll look at uh, in detail because they're pretty influential. We will look uh, a little bit about how do I get these properties? How do I get a circuit type that satisfies these properties? Because it looks like this is the secret of computation. This is the essence in a way. And it turns out that there are two methods, uh, or you can classify methods according to one of two categories. You see that top-down approaches are based on um, exhaustive search, in particular um, exhaustive DPLL, which we talked about before. And bottom-up approaches work differently. We got a taste of that or a hint of that last time. And today we'll be talking about top-down approaches. The difference between them is probably better discussed when we have them both, but just to give you an idea. Sometimes which one to choose is not an option because it is determined by what format is your input? Is it a CNF or is it an arbitrary Boolean formula? So sometimes this choice is dictated on you. The other thing is roughly the top-down approaches tend to do way better in terms of space compared to the bottom-up approaches. And um, again, at some point, you'll know the story inside out. Let's get started. There's a couple of big ideas here, and we will go over them. And there's so many variations on them. But uh, one of the big ideas is that we can use uh, exhaustive DPLL on a Boolean formula and keep a trace of it. And you'll see what that means in a very specific sense. And that trace end up being a circuit compilation, okay? But when you start doing exhaustive DPLL, uh, there are a couple of very important improvements on the algorithm, which we didn't discuss before. And we will discuss today because they're critical if you use DPLL or exhaustive DPL to do model counting, and they're also critical if you do compilation. So what you'll be getting out of today is how can you turn an exhaustive DPLL algorithm into a knowledge compiler? And what you will also get is a couple of fundamental techniques that people introduce to exhaustive DPLL um, that is essential to how they work or how effective they can be. So let's get started with the first idea. And, and we'll contrast again DPLL versus exhaustive DPLL. So we've seen that DPLL is doing this uh, depth first search. You give me a formula like this, you say, is it satisfiable? And what you do is you pick up a variable, you set its value, and then that simplifies the formula, and then you keep going. And now, if this ends up being sat, you're done, right? If this guy here, so if this guy here ends up being sat, you're done. If not, then you go and try the other value. And then again, you got a simpler formula. Sometimes we call this the residual formula, which is the formula that we got by conditioning on V equals false and so on. Okay, now determination condition as we've seen is basically uh, when we satisfy the formula or it's a contradiction and you saw a whole bunch of techniques that you can use unit resolution to make this simplify things and discover contradictions early. Uh, we've seen conflict-directed backtracking. Um, you can take this all the way to doing closed learning and branching heuristics and so on. Okay, now, what we'll see, as I mentioned, is if you run this algorithm to exhaustion and keep a trace, then you end up getting a knowledge compiler. And the fascinating part of the story is that you can ask me, compile what? I mean, I have different circuits. What will What circuit type will this give me? Well, as you'll see, there are variations on exhaustive DPLL. And depending on which variation you use, you will end up getting a different circuit type, which are referred to here as languages. Now, these variations existed before the story. I mean, people who were using exhaustive DPLL to model counting, they were saying, oh, let's try to do this. Oh, let's try to do that. Oh, this would make it more efficient. And it turns out these things end up leading to different circuit types when you keep trace. It's, it's a very fascinating connection between two different areas and it has implications. But let me, let's remove the mysteries and get to the bottom line of what is a trace. So let's take a look at exhaustive DPLL once more. Here's the formula, CNF, and I'm gonna show you how exhaustive DPLL look at it visually. 
So you start with the variable x and I set it to zero, that is false. And now I go to y and let's say I set y to uh, zero. And you can see in this case, the formula will uh, be unset, right? You're gonna violate, I believe this clause. So no, that didn't work. So what do you do? You go try y equals one. And if you do that, now you, you don't get either set or unset and and then you pick z and if you try z equals one it would be unset so you try z equals zero and now you can satisfy the formula okay so if i was doing dpll i'm done correct and i give you back a variable instantiation say set x to zero y to one z to zero you're done now exhaustive dpl what did we say you keep going so what does keep going mean in this case it means i have to go and run to exhaustion. And in this case, I have to try x equals one, right? And then I try, you know, this guy, da, unset, set. Okay, again, I found another solution, but I keep going. And that's what happens in this case. You've seen that algorithm, you probably actually emulated it. And we call this determination tree. And we even hinted that actually this looks like a decision tree. Now, what is keeping a trace? Keeping a trace is if you were doing exhaustive DPLL to count, then you would be getting down here and you say, okay, I counted this. And then you keep going, say, oh, let me count that. Okay, but you're really not keeping this stuff in memory, but now we'll do that. And if you look at what happened here, the places that exhaustive DPLL went to, if you um, keep track of them, you get a circuit back because look, what is this fragment? We've seen this here. Remember, this is like if X is true, go this way. If X is false, go that way. That you can think of it as a little circuit fragment that looks like this. Uh, we call these nodes decision nodes, remember? Uh, they always call them decision nodes in these kind of representations, decision trees and graphs. But when we looked at a circuit fragment like this, we said this is a decision node. And th this guy is obtained from this by simply doing that transformation. So if you're keeping track of where you went to through the search, as we're doing here, you basically can <laughs> generate a circuit compilation of your original formula. In this case, um, this is equivalent to the original CNF formula. Okay, now that's the level, you know, ba baseline. We're gonna do better than this, but do you get the idea? That's that's the that's the main idea here. Is you run DPL to exhaustion, and you keep a trace of where you've been to, and that ends up being a circuit. All right, now that's not a very interesting circuit. In fact, that is a tree. And now we're gonna see two major techniques um, that not only make this efficient, but also end up controlling the kind of circuits you end up getting out of this. So you cannot generate every kind of compiler this way, but the, some of the dominant and most interesting compilers work this way. So let's, talk about one major technique that we're gonna use to improve this. And uh, this is the technique that if you just do what I told you, the circuits that you're gonna be getting back will have a lot of redundancy in them. That is, they will have replicated portions. So if you look, you can see that from the uh, termination tree or the decision tree of exhaustive DPLL, right? And you can see, for example, this portion is identical to this portion. And we're gonna call that redundancy. We wanna avoid that uh, because in the worst case that could lead to exponential increase in size and will basically kill the efficiency of the algorithm. And we're gonna do this in two ways. One is a very straightforward way, which any one of us would do if you were implementing this system. And we're gonna call this level one, which is do not record redundant portions of traces. Um, that means do not keep both in memory. Uh, keep only one copy and, and when you need it again, just point to it. And we'll see there is a technique called unique node uh, that comes from the OBDD literature, which allows you to do this very easily actually. 
But then we're going to look at the more sophisticated one. This one doesn't really impact complexity, time complexity. It impacts the size of the final thing you're going to get. Uh, the, then the next technique is we're going to try to avoid solving equivalence of problems. Because look, what happened here? The fact that you have these two, that means you did a sub-search here and did a sub-search that were equivalent in some way. And I'm going to try to avoid that. And then we're going to start getting into improving time complexity and exponentially based on the second technique. So let's see the first technique. First technique is pretty straightforward. And to realize, the first technique realize every node that I have in this trace is either boundary set and set or a decision node. That is a node with two children. So these are the only three creatures. So if I make sure that I do not construct except for one set and one unset leaves, and then I would not construct two nodes that are labeled with the same variable if they both have the same children. We, we call this the high child. This is the low child. So if you have a decision node with a high child and a low child, let's say C1, C2, and then you've already constructed a decision node that looks like that, then you actually just point to it, don't construct it again. And you can do this using a hash table very easily. And this is known as the unique node technique. So look what happens if you do that. And, and now you're gonna start seeing some interesting surprises. So he, here I am. I'm, I'm gonna have only one copy of set, one copy of unset. So let's see, one copy of set only, and then one copy of unset only. And look at the two guys, label Z. Uh, now it's obvious that they're the same thing. Uh, labeled with the same variable, have exactly the same high and low child. If you are caching those in a hash table, then when you're about to add this to the circuit, you say, before I add Z with these two children, do I already have a node in the circuit that look like this? And then you say, yes. Well, let me point to it. Okay, so I'm not gonna create this guy, I'm gonna point to it. Okay, now look at the creature we have now. Do you recognize this guy? Have we seen the circuit type before? What is it called? Decision graph and more particular, OBDD. OBDD, it's an ordered binary decision diagram. Now, the reason it was an OBDD, because when I did exhaustive DPLL, in this case, I visited the variables always in the same order. Because remember, uh, we have a decision graph. Uh, the ordered decision graph is when uh, I visit the variable order in the same way, regardless of how I go. So when I did DPLL, in this case, I made sure that I always visited X first, Y, and then Z. And the trace in this case is an OBDD. Uh, by the way, OBDDs have been around for a very long time. And the very first wave of algorithms for compiling them were not like this. They were bottom up. And when this came out, this algorithm, it was uh, developed by one of our past graduate students, Yimbo Huang. Um, this algorithm um, led to new complexity results that did not exist before. And it was just simply taking, you know, the exhaustive TPLL and doing um, uh, effectively keeping a trace of it. I'm going to ask a question actually now. So this is, okay, this is an OBDD. You guys remember what an FBDD was, the free binary decision diagram. There was one difference between the, these two creatures. Uh, the OBDD required uh, an ordering excellent, and the FBDD did not require a variable ordering. So the FBDD uh, said, that's okay, you can visit variables in different ways across different routes. So this way you can do X, Y, Z, this way you can do X, Z, Y. And the question I have for you, can I use this algorithm to compile FBDDs instead of OBDDs? What do I need to do? to actually use this uh, algorithm that we had. And, and someone uh, says, no, that was the previous answer. Let me show you here. This is exhaustive DPLL. What do we have to do so that the trace end up being an FBDD more generally instead of an OBDD? Right, we, 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 use, no, we use exhaustive DPLL, but I do not insist on following the same variable order. I use a branching heuristic, right? So I, I start, let's say by X, and I go down here and then I say to myself, what is the best variable to try now? And then maybe it's Y. But when I go down here and I say, what's the best variable to try next? It could be Z, I'll do that and I'm fine because I'm doing an FBDD. I don't need the same variable ordering, right? 
if, if you are doing this using to get an OBDD, you have to start up front by saying, what total variable ordering should I use? And then you say, think about it and you say, okay, I'm gonna use X, Y, Z, or you say, I'm gonna use X, Z, Y, and you stick to it. And that's called a static variable ordering. It's done up front and you stick to it. But if I do dynamic variable ordering and on the spot, depending on where I am in the tree and I go and say, what is the best thing to try now? Uh, you will end up getting an FBDD. <laughs> now, here's the interesting thing. Uh, the interesting thing is if you, um, let me flip through this uh, and uh, exhaust DPL with fixed variable order and unique nodes, you get an OBDD. If you use dynamic variable ordering, you get uh, unique nodes. Intuitively, if I were to tell you, you know, do exhaustive DPL while sticking to a variable order versus, you know what, no, just do what really works best. As you're doing it, pick opportunistically what variable to try next. Now, intuitively, you would think, of course, the second strategy will be better. But now this is not intuitive anymore because the trace of the first is an OBDD. The trace of the second is an FBDD. And we know that they're exponentially separated. We do know that there are Boolean functions that if you represent as an OBDD, they will blow up regardless of what total variable ordering you use. But if you allow yourself to test variables differently across the branches, you can represent them in poly polynomial time. What does that tell you about DPLL? That tells you that if you run DPLL with dynamic variable ordering versus static variable ordering, I know of Boolean formulas on which one of them will blow up and the other will not. So I used what I know about circuits and tractable circuits to prove properties of search algorithms. Uh, what this came out actually, that was very interesting because that gives you a new proof technique uh, of how efficient or not efficient a search algorithm is by reasoning about the trace it leaves behind as a circuit and then invoking what we really know about these tractable circuits, right? Fascinating story. Uh, I need to tell you uh, about now uh, two, may, two, two um, further techniques. Uh, we'll keep going with the redundancy story and now we get <laughs> to another way of dealing with redundancy and that is level two. Now I wanna be ambitious. It, no, I, I, it's not enough for me to not record the same trace again. I want to avoid constructing certain traces that are uh, replicants of others if I can. And look at this concept here. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very interesting concept. Um, here's part of an exhaustive DPLL uh, trace, okay? Look what happened here. I have the CNF, it's here, right? And I'm searching. So. This is part of the termination tree for the exhausted TPL. Under this branch, X1 is zero, X2 is one, and X3 is one. And if you simplify this formula under that variable setting, you get this, okay? Now, here's a different branch in the search. Here I'm trying X1, X, uh, X1, one, you know, zero, one, and I simplify, and look what happens. They're the same. They are different branches of the search space, but, Setting certain variables this way or that way always lead to the same residual formula. What does that mean, folks? That means when I'm diving down here to basically count the models of this or to keep a trace, which is effectively trying to compile the subformula, that's I'm doing the exact same work down here. Correct? You see that? It's, it's redundant work. It's the and I want to avoid that. I wanna be able to detect that and say, oh, wait a minute, I've done this before. Don't do it again. Now, in this case, what does don't do it again mean? It means I already have a compilation of the subformula. just point to it, all right? And how do you do this? Simplest way to do this, and interestingly, this is one place where people can do better, is you do something called formula caching. At every point in the search like this one, when I finished, doing this and therefore I, I have compiled it or I've searched it, I will have a cache where I would say, this formula was done and this was the answer. And say, whoa, wait a minute. That's, you know, if you have a million claws and you're doing this, that's a lot of work, right? Uh, well, people came with a whole bunch of ideas to generate keys for formulas while minimizing their sizes. And 
then cache them. But then you think, but, but still, still, I mean, that's a lot of caching. And yes, it is a lot. But here's the piece of news for, for you guys. If you don't do this, <laughs> you basically die. <laughs> so <laughs> whatever it is, it is better than not doing it. Because you have to understand, if you don't do this, you can do exponentially more, more work because you may be revisiting things again and again and again and again. So formula caching is critical for exhaustive DPLL in general and for when you are actually using them to compile these formulas. And that's formula caching. Now, there's one more idea uh, that we need, but I want to dwell a little bit on formula caching just more because you say, okay, this looks great. And okay, you know, fine. People who build systems, they say, yeah, you have to do this. Otherwise you die for, okay, we'll believe you guys. You guys build these things, you've tried them. But can something be said about the complexity of this? Can something be said about how much caching you can do? And can this kind of caching allow you to prove complexity results and so on? Sometimes yes. And in fact, I want to give you next a flavor of that. It's a very simple story uh, that come up when we are doing compilation in the simplest way using a total variable ordering, fixed variable ordering and compiling OBDDs. You can actually give a bound on how many uh, distinct things you're going to see if you end up caching. And you can come up actually with a nice complexity result. Um, let's do that first. So we're diving a little bit more into formula caching, but I hope we won't lose the big picture because we're going to dive a little bit in a couple of slides there and pop up, do one more idea. And we're pretty much, you know, done on that. So let's go to this fascinating story about formula caching in the context of uh, exhaustive DPLL using uh, total variable ordering and see what happens. The, the first observation, and, and this is one of these areas what you know, I hope people would be interested also and do more work there. If you look at DPLL as we discussed it, exhaustive DPLL, you can think of every node is trying, as we said, try to compile something, right? So the whole, search tree is compiling an OBDD for the original CNF. When you set this guy to false, now you're trying to compile an OBDD for Delta given this. And when you're branching on V1 equals one, okay. So you can label the nodes in your search tree as trying to compile what we call residual formulas. So this is called a residual formula because it's the result of conditioning that, that, that. Now look at this observation. Look at this observation. I'm gonna to try to show you that we already realized that some of these recursive calls may be doing the same thing. And now we're gonna to try to see how we can actually bound this. Okay, this is a very busy slide. It's very intuitive. So don't get scared. Let's look at it step by step. Here's what happened. Uh, this is the Boolean formula that I have, okay? It has one, two, three, four, five clauses. And in this case, I chose the variable ordering one, two, three. So I'm actually uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I am using that for exhaustive DPL. Look what happens. At, level, uh, at the level in this search tree after I've set the values of V1, V2, V3, right? So let's look at this picture. So I said V1, and then I said V2, and I said V3. So we're looking at that level. Look what happens, okay? At that point, what is the residual formula? Well, I, I potentially have eight of them because at that level in the search tree, I have set these three variables and I could have set them in any of these eight possible ways. So what is the residual formula? Now you take this guy and condition it on each one of these and look what you get, these variations. So in principle, you could have gotten eight distinct formulas, but in this case, how many distinct ones are you getting? So there's three. There is the guy in red, the guys in um, blue, and there is a contradiction. Now, if you were doing formula caching, if you're not doing formula caching, at that level, you will be running eight different searches, correct? If you're doing formula caching, you'll be doing at most, you'll be doing three, correct? Now, here's the surprise. Here's the surprise. There is an easy way to predict or to bound how many distinct subformulas you're gonna see at a certain level. I'm gonna show it to you next, it's very simple. Uh, you can look at your variable ordering and your clauses and you can just do something very simple and say, ah, I guarantee you, 
uh, when you set the, these variables one, two, three, four, you will not see more than that many distinct formulas, even though in general they could be exponential, and I'll bound them for you. And therefore, if you do caching, now I can use that to tell you the complexity. Well, look at the observation, it's pretty interesting. Uh, here it is. You draw this figure, and that figure gives you a very nice bound on the number of distinct formulas you're going to see. What did we do here? We, we went and plotted our variable order, v1, v2, v3, v4, 5, 6. And what did we do? For every clause, we showed what variables it spans. So this is 5, 6, 5, 6. Uh, this is the biggest clause span. Uh, no, this is 4, 5, 6, 4, 5, 6. This is the biggest one, 1, 3, da, da. OK, you see what's going on. You see the picture? What were we doing? OK, <laughs> now, look what happens. After I set 1, 2, 3, I want to know, after that setting, how many distinct formulas can I get? And you can bound that by just counting how many of the clauses crossed between three and four. In this case, we only have one of them, this guy. That's the only guy that crossed. What does that mean? Look what happens. You guys look at it visually. If you set this and this and this to any values, and you're here, right, what's going to happen? you end up having only one of three cases. First case is because you set one, two, and three, you may have violated one of these clauses, correct? That's a contradiction. That's one case, correct? So this is, uh, this, okay, the, the, they're not nicely aligned, but this is two and three, this is this guy. If, if you set this to false and that to false, you would have created a contradiction. Now, let's say you do not have a contradiction, okay? What other cases you may have? And you're here. You're here and you set one, two, and three, you did not get a contradiction. What does that mean? What happens to this formula? You must have satisfied it, correct? Because you've set all of its variables. Then you either satisfy it or contradict it. We're saying we don't have a contradiction, you satisfied it. And what happens to this guy? You satisfied it. And I'm here, right? And the only clause that is left to determine the residual formula, the residual formula is decided by this clause, this clause, and the state of that. That clause could be in one of two states. When I set one, two, three, either completely satisfied or these two guys are resolved. So it could be in only one of two states. So your residual formula is this, this, and whatever state this guy is, which is one of two cases. So in this case, because there is only one formula that crosses and it could be in one of two states, that's two possibilities and contradiction is the third. And more generally, we call that the cut set at variable three the number of clauses, and you can bound uh, the uh, number of states or the number of residual formula to be exponential only in the cut set. You, you, it cannot be worse than that. So exactly, so someone's saying two uh, raised to the power number of crossing clauses plus one, exactly. That is the bound. Now you will not get that complexity if you don't do caching, but if you do caching, then, you will end up being only exponential in that basically crossing number. It's actually even more. Remember when we talked about how do you do caching? Are you really going to generate a key by looking at every clause? Well, in this case, this tells you no. In this case, it says your cache at this level should only index the state of this clause. Now, if you go to another level, this guy, you have two clauses. And that tells you just keep track of the state of these clauses. You, your, your cache key should only do that. Don't worry about the rest. This is an example of someone who sat there and said, you know, I, I want to do something principled here. I don't want to just like go and code something that works efficiently. I want to do some analysis and figure out what's going on, da, 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 and give guarantees. And because when you do this, what does that tell you? That tell you maybe I can make the compilation faster by actually starting with a variable order that minimizes these cut set sizes. And that actually is known as the cut width. So if you look at all possible cuts and you look at the maximum one, that's known as the cut width of that order for that CNF. And then you may want to say, let me try to find ways to generate variable orders that have a small cut width because that optimizes my OBDD. Well, it happens that Jimbo Huang, who was a graduate student here a while back, did that thinking and produced uh, one of these outcomes here. And let me just summarize this by, this is, okay, it's a busy slide, but it has 
what we talked about, right? This is the guarantee that some, one of you, Eli, I think wrote this, that a number of distinct residual formulas will end up being this, exponential in this plus one. And therefore, you can show that the time and space complexity of this compilation algorithm with that caching is exponential in only this. Now, now, what is cut width? Cut width is the largest value for this across all i. We call that cut width. So you end up being exponential only in cut width and linear in number, number of variables. Now you can have a variation on this technique and you get something called path width, which is another way to cache, another way to bound. I just wanted to give you a flavor of doing this in principle. And um, there's one more concept that we need to go over and we'll uh, try to wrap up here, guys. So now you have to realize how important this is in the grand scheme of things. So now we're not talking AI, right? I mean, this is CS stuff, right? Computer science, think computer science, complexity classes. I just, before we move on, we had the complexity classes. We had the prototypical problems for them. Big complexity classes, they have a lot. We had the prototypical problems for them. And we said that if you compile these Boolean formulas into circuits with the right type, you basically solve these problems. And then we showed the reduction. So if you really computationally want to own these classes, you want to play this game. And, and really, as the, the more we push the envelope as far as compiling Boolean formulas into circuits of the appropriate type, we serve computation to everyone, right? Not just for this. And uh, you will see this as we go on. Let's go to the last technique here. So here's the summary. We did plain DPLL, exhaustive DPLL. Uh, with, with dynamic variable ordering, we get FBDDs. If we use exhaustive DPLL with a fixed variable ordering, we get OBDDs. There is another technique that the folks doing exhaustive DPL introduced, and uh, that's known as component analysis. And I'll, it's a very simple idea. And then we'd see that if we integrate it into exhaustive DPLL, then the traces will end up being even more general than what we looked at. Component analysis is something very simple. It says you have your formula, original one, and you go and fix some values of some variables. You say x is zero, y is one, and so on. It's possible that when you simplify the formula, it's possible at, at that setting, it may split into independent components. So you may have a set of clauses, another set of clauses where they do not interact at all. There's no common variables between them, decomposability, right? They, they don't have variables in common. So the idea, if that happens, go and, and solve them independently. Spawn two independent exhaustive DPLL searches on each one, and that should work. We're, we're gonna see that if you actually use that technique, you start getting decomposable and deterministic, you know, this class of circuits. So let's see it on this example. Here's the Boolean formula. And I went and set A to false. Now in this case, look what happened. It simplified to this. And, and these two clauses are independent. They do not share variables. So I could have solved them independently and got a compilation for each. Now, what do I do? How do I combine these now? How do I combine these two guys? Type something. There are two independent clauses, I, and, excellent. So I just put an and between them. And then now I'll, my, my compilation looks a little bit different. Now, if you go and, and do the other branch, you get this. Now you're getting this weird looking creature. It does have some decision nodes in it like this, but then it has these and nodes. That's fine. We just have to get rid of these and see what the circuit look like. So in this case, the circuit looks like this. If we go and do the substitution, you know, that's what we get. That's another circuit type. Now, this is not an FBDD. This is not an OBDD. This is now deterministic decomposable negation of form. Okay, it's this guy, uh, but it's a little bit more specific. And, and uh, I'll tell you why it's a little bit more specific than this class. In fact, later this was called decision DNNF. We didn't use that term before. And the reason is it, is, it is this guy, but the or nodes always are decision nodes. They always look like this. It's kind of a new combination. And so it's a little bit specific. It's a subset of that particular guy. Because again, I'm, I'm, I'm getting determinism in a very specific way. So yes, every OR gate, the two children are mutually exclusive, but they're mutually exclusive in a trivial way in a sense, because one of them has a variable and the other one has the opposite of that variable. 
these guys do not require that. These guys do not say when you have a conflict, it has to be over a single variable. They do not say this. It says as long as they're mutually exclusive, you're good. But this does it in a very specific way. They end up having more properties and they deserve their own name, which is uh, this particular guy. All right. So if we're going to look at the summary, if you run the exhaustive DPLL with fixed variable ordering, you get OBDD. If you use it with dynamic variable ordering, you get FBDDs. If you allow decomposition or component analysis, you basically get uh, this particular guy. And that's already quite a bit. Um, so actually, I just tell you, the, the fancy compilers these days and the ones that win competitions and so on, they're based on this and they do compile into this guy. That's the most commonly compiled into circuit type, uh, especially for model counting and, and probabilistic reasoning. And I wanna end here with a couple of remarks on uh, the power of this idea and the limitation of doing compilation this way and uh, give people a couple of challenges. Um, and the first idea is, which we already mentioned, the implications of doing things this way. Okay, so when you do compilers this way, everything we studied in the first part is very relevant. In fact, you know, exhaustive DPLL has behind it uh, unit resolution. It, uh, some of these advanced compilers also use conflict-directed backtracking and all of these techniques are relevant. And the other thing is what we mentioned that we can use the language properties, particularly what we know about sizes to help characterize the power and limitations of search algorithms, right? I, I gave you an example of that earlier, but if you know how to establish the trace of a search algorithm, then you can say a lot about it in terms of its both powers and limitations. If the algorithm end up having its traces in this language, then we know that that algorithm not only can do whatever it's supposed to do, but it can answer any queries that are tractable on this circuit type, right? So you tell me I'm building an algorithm and that algorithm solves problem uh, da, and I look at it and I find that its traces are uh, DNNF. Then I'll tell you, well, did you know that your algorithm knows how to project in, in linear time? says, no, I didn't know. Well, I'll tell you, you are actually compiling a circuit that looks like that and da, da, da. But then the other part is, you know that the algorithm will be hopeless on those things that do not have polysize representation. We, saw, we, we, we mentioned this example before. Again, it's a technique that gives you the ability to prove lower bounds in another way. Now, let me end with the following observation. Here's two limitations of doing things this way. One of them is, uh, even though the exhaustive DPLL uh, generates algorithms uh, or circuits that are deterministic, as we saw, it only generates a very specific type of determinism decision. So anytime you have an OR, the conflict is over a single variable. It's not capable of doing this as is. What's happening here? There's an OR. If you look at this subformula here, so formula here, and you look at this, they conflict. Try them at home. If you call this guy alpha and you call this guy beta, alpha and beta are mutually exclusive. Yet, there is no single variable on which they disagree, but they contradict each other. Uh, what we talked about will not be able to generate this as is, right? And that is limiting. It's even more limiting, and maybe we should end that slide. That, uh, there's one more slide. Um, can you tell me another limitation in terms of compilation? What, what does this guy cannot do as is? What kind of circuit types it will not generate? Or what is built into this algorithm? Look, I mean, look at this guy here. This is not only determinism, it's also decision, right? And, and why, why do, this is so characteristic of the traces of these algorithms, why? Because that's what they do, they branch on variables. This is essential to how they work. They pick a variable, try this, pick another variable, try that. And so everything they generate is deterministic. And well, you know, what, what about this guy? Generating something that is not deterministic, all right? Um, that's outside the scope of this as is, right? As we actually discussed it. So, um, but still, as I mentioned, uh, if you go back to this picture here, uh, that's 
pretty common and um, a lot of the compilers are doing this. Some of these compilers were built from scratch for this, and some actually were originally developed as uh, model counters using Zosif TPLL, and uh, people went and added the trace, and they turned them into knowledge compilers. Um, so we're done, folks. Thank you very much. And um, I guess I will see you next week.